Um, yes, yeah, so this series of talks, uh, The Heart's Journey from Darkness to Light, um, is really a, um, I think it's, it's a series that's going to give us a, a, a way of looking at the nature of the spiritual life. Um, and I think the eight or nine talks that follow this will be bringing out various facets of that. Um, hopefully, as Gina Vajras suggested, in the light of positive <laughs> emotion. That was where we started with the idea for, uh, for this series. So in today's talk, I want to introduce the, <coughs> let me, introduce the theme, The Heart's Journey from Darkness to Light itself. And the future talks will explore aspects of that in their own, in their own ways. Um, I'm going to start with reflections on the concept of darkness to light. I then want to have a look at the path of the heart's journey and then look at the heart undertaking this heart's journey. Um, yes, and as Julian Vajra said, sadly, I've abandoned the theme I had thought of, which is uh, Prometheus Unbound. I did think Shelley's play of that name was probably a little bit too um, obscure uh, to get to bring a lot out. My inspiration is my own fault for uh, for suggesting that title. So sorry I've misled anyone who uh, was looking forward to uh, Prometheus. Um, so this transition from darkness to light, I think we recognize it as quite a, a popular theme in spiritual life. <laughs> it's a popular theme in religion, myth, uh, legend, psychology, poetry, music, literature, painting, and even, even in something as obscure as politics. And I think we're seeing that being played out as I, uh, as I speak. So the, the concept uh, presumes that there's a negative state of existence or mind, a state which is unpleasant, painful, and limited, and that this state embodies what we call ignorance. That's the darkness from our point of view. Uh, it also presumes that there's a positive state of, uh, of existence or mind that's pleasant, free from suffering, and boundless in its freedom and beauty. And that embodies what we call awakening. So uh, a simple conception of moving from darkness to light, from ignorance to awakening, uh, would perhaps be that we simply do whatever's prescribed in our practices in order to escape the, the darkness. But it's not quite as simple as that, is it? I think we may have noticed uh, the spiritual path from darkness to light is by no means linear. We're, we're, we're going to take quite a few diversions for sure on that path. Um, it's not prescribed by reason alone. The Buddha did say, show me a reasonable person and I'll lead them to enlightenment. Uh, but no, I think the, the spiritual path is not prescribed by reason alone. Uh, the path on this heart's journey, I'm sure, will be a contest of reason and emotion that drives us. For many of us, it'll be a contest between those two sides of things. It'll also be a contest of uh, deeply held views versus the, the new revealed perspectives that we're encountering along the way. Uh, so starting out as we do in, in a state of ignorance, um, our misapprehension of reality, our innate delusion, is going to trip us up along the way. Thankfully, we'll be supported by times when we do see quite clearly the basic realities, impermanence, uh, and so forth. <coughs> so the transition uh, will, be will be paradoxical. I think that the, uh, the tradition of Buddhism loves little less than, little more than paradox. Uh, it's, it's a commonly used 
tool to enable us to see the nature of things. And the transition from darkness to light uh, is going to be paradoxical. Uh, to leave behind the darkness or ignorance, we'll certainly need to go more deeply into the darkness, deeply into uh, our ignorance. Uh, our, the darkness may be a whole host of things from our point of view, it may be fear, maybe anxiety, ego resistance, the legacy of past sufferings. Who knows what uh, what, what for each of us uh, that may invoke and represent. Uh, and without some guidance of wisdom, we might find ourselves stuck in the darkness. But fortunately, wisdom and uh, compassion will be the benefits that we gain uh, from embracing the darkness. But this is nothing new, nothing, not even particularly uh, Buddhism. I think most, a lot of traditions that are interested in mind uh, would embrace that, that idea, that paradox. So in, uh, in, in, in the spiritual life, we're all of us bound to be led, I think, by our most effective abilities and our favorite practices. Um, and this may be what we call our leading edge. Uh, the, the edge may be something like meditation, study, devotion, faith, uh, reasoning, intellect, kind-heartedness. All of these things will, will serve as well as a leading edge to our, to our practice. But there, there is always also something that we don't perhaps uh, give enough attention to. There's a counterpart, which is our trailing edge. So what trails us is the qualities that we have that remain unchallenged by our current understanding and our current practice. Uh, what trails is all the qualities that we have that remain yeah, untouched by what we're engaging in, in practice. Uh, it's not just our faults and failings. I think we can all understand that uh, you know, we, we've got faults, we've got failings, we've got aspects of um, our experience of being me that we don't particularly like. So we can understand that things like that will be part of our trailing edge, but it also may be something quite positive that's not yet been challenged by the Dharma in order to be, to be brought forth out of us. I think we can look forward to uh, uh, that particular, you know, that kind of trailing edge emerging from our practice into a leading edge. Um, you probably know about our work in India. You probably know about the, the, the order in India. It's quite a, a large body of order members these days. Uh, in 1978, Lokamitra um, left the, the UK to go and work amongst primarily the ex-untouchable community in, uh, in Pune, um, a community which included quite a number of people who had been disciples of Sangharakshita in the time when he was living in India and working amongst that community. Lokamitra left, yeah, he went forth. He went forth as an Anagarika, um, not as a, a Dhammachari, to, to work in that community, to live heart, you know, in the heart of that community and work with it for the sake of the Dhamma. Um, when, when I was working in India in, in the late 80s, I, uh, I was chatting to Lokamitra about his work. And he said, to, uh, you know, look, I, I never thought of myself as a leader. Um, and yet, if you any inkling of how the, the movement has grown, uh, in, not in terms of you know, just all numbers of order members, the, the vast number of people involved in our movement in India, the work it does socially and so forth. Um, it seems ironic that Lokamitra uh, didn't think of himself as a leader, but he's led forth, um, you know, a, uh, a, an incredible blossoming of, of Dharma work in, in India. So, you know, we, the, uh, it may, you know, our, our, our trailing edge may be things that are just getting left behind, as it were. <coughs> uh, 
Yes, and, and of course, it, it may be uh, unrecognized negativities that we've that we've not yet resolved, things that past experiences that we've not yet resolved. Um, so this transition from darkness to light uh, is ultimately about freedom from all that holds us back from the bliss of being Dharma. Uh, it's, yes, it's, it's everything that comes out of the darkness that is of the darkness, as it were. So we better get on with the heart's journey. Let's, let's leave behind the darkness. Uh, and I'm thinking of the heart's journey, um, and this was the original inspiration in a way, uh, as an allegory of uh, metaphors and myths about the spiritual life. Um, so let's take in something of the nature of the journey and by design and by asides and, and outcries, um, some of the, the the metaphors and myths will will flow forth, uh, and simplify all the many many things we could say about the heart's journey. I want to sort of narrow it down to a, a couple of aspects of the journey itself uh, that it has a purpose and it has a path. So. And from the point of view of, of the purpose of the heart's journey, uh, and this in a way, you know, that gives us a hint that the heart's journey is something of an odyssey, a, uh, a, a long journey involving many adventures that will lead us to uh, a desirable endpoint. Uh, so the purpose of our journey, uh, this, for today at least, is purification and awakening. From the point of view of purification, uh, we're undertaking a journey from darkness of our unenlightened state to something more luminous. Um, and if we think about that, it's it's a journey that's going to, we're going to recognize that the journey is one of purifying the mind that needs to move from the darkness of our unenlightened state to a luminous a more aware state. And what we need to purify our mind of is what we call the kleshas. So the kleshas are all the negative mental tendencies that derive from our old friends, greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, and the kleshas, these neg all the negative tendencies whatsoever that cloud and disturb our mind. The kleshas come from a, a, a verb klish, which means to torment, to trouble, and to suffer. Uh, <clears throat> so the purification aspect of our journey, we can simplify by saying, well, this is going to be about clearing the kleshas from our mind, from our nature, from our motivations, from, from everything about, about us, as it were. And then there's awakening. Um, we probably we probably think of awakening as bringing something in, attaining something. I think that's the way we we approach uh, the, the idea of awakening in, uh, in in practice. We have the idea that okay, you, you you live an ethical life, you you meditate, you get into deep meditation, you reflect. On, on some point of dharma, and Bob's your uncle, awakening comes in, as it were, we attain what we call insight. Uh, that's simplifying the, the concept somewhat. But um, I think that's fair enough to think of awakening as something that we attain, something from outside that we experience as coming in. Uh, and much of our practice is, gain, is geared to uh, a relationship with awakening in, in, along those lines. But from the point of purification, uh, I think we, we need to take a different perspective on the idea of awakening our mind. Uh, I think we need to uh, think of it more in terms of uh, clearing something out. Uh, and what we're clearing out, of course, is the, uh, is, is the, is the clashes. So awakening as much as 
wrestling as it were with reality can i can i use that concept i think i think it may ring ring a bell with, with some people trying to awaken this apparently unawake uh, unawakened mind maybe maybe we can just think okay it's about clearing out the the clashes um uh okay let's bring in something of uh, of mythology into that you might have heard of the labors of Hercules from the Greek tradition. Uh, one of them is that um, he was tasked with clearing out the, the stables of King Ogeus. Um, Ogeus was a very, very wealthy king. He had lots and lots of cattle and goats and goodness knows what, and he had them stabled. And if any of you have been around cattle and horses, as I was, uh, you know um, what that means. The stables get, get pretty mucky. Um, and uh, Hercules was charged with cleaning out the, uh, the stables. It's a very crafty, very crafty fellow. Instead of, you know, getting a fork and, uh, and a barrow, uh, which is something I'd did a lot in my youth as a child. Um, he diverted a couple of rivers along some channels right through the stables and then just washed out the uh, washed out all the the cattle down. So I think we, you know, it's a nice myth for uh, um, encouraging myth in a way. How easy it seems to do to to clear out something. So. Uh, how does that work in, uh, in, 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 in practice, in our practice? Um, maybe we think about the, what we might call the favorite people that we have in the Metta Bhavana. Um, I'm thinking more towards the end of the Metta Bhavana than the, than the first two. Um, how do we see them as a result of practice? Have we come to see them more insightfully after applying the kindness of our heart to their faults and their threats. None of our business really, but we, it's what we do in the Metta Bhavana, or at least that's how it can be approached. So what have we cleared out if we can see um, that we're seeing people in the Metta more insightfully than we were when we started? So it doesn't have to be a grand project. Uh, I think it's something you know we, we all appreciate that we're doing in our in our daily practice. So the uh, the path coming to the path, and remembering that we have a purpose and a path. So what? Pardon me, sir. What takes us on this journey of clearing out the glaciers? Uh, well, there are many models of the path, uh, of what the, the spiritual life might be largely perhaps in terms of paths of actions, uh, things that we might follow. So we've got the threefold path of meditation, morality, and wisdom. As you know, we take them in that order usually, not in the order, the order they should be, inverted commas. Um, there are the six or 10 perfections of qualities like uh, patience and energy. Uh, there's the path of transcending the fetters of a false self view and doubt, greed and hatred and so forth, uh, where we told that there's a very tangible goal of stream entry uh, to be achieved. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, uh, you know, the stock, the stock standard, the, the original version of the path, the Noble Eightfold Path of, of vision and uh, end moving along from darkness to light. The, the Noble Eightfold Path in a way describes quite well that path from, uh, from the, the darkness of the way we normally speak, act and so forth in light of the vision of right, of right view. <coughs> so um, our theme for these talks that, that emerge in the next few weeks may well partic partake of many more expressions of, of the, the path. But essentially, the path of, of the heart's journey from darkness to light is about the mythic and imaginative world of being a Buddhist, a Dharma follower, 
if you felt attracted to the title of these talks, I think that's what was responding within you. Say, oh, I better go along and, and listen to this. So um, looking at the path, I want to look at it from, from two points of view and uh, out of the many possibilities. Uh, firstly, uh, the exoteric nature of the path. In the spiritual life, we, we do have an exoteric path. <clears throat> In other words, all the things that we do, meditation, mindfulness, generosity, ethics, reflection, study, puja, working in right livelihood, living in a community. There's a couple of uh, old favourites uh, thrown in there at the end. They're not so well known these days, seemingly, but um, this, this is the exoteric path. The things that we do. When I... Uh, uh, when I was number a lad of 26, I went on a, a long retreat where I decided that, yes, I wanted to be a, uh, to, to, to be ordained. And I went to see Sangharachita for the first time. So very nervous meeting this, this sort of legendary figure as he, as he was uh, to us um, and told him that, uh, yes, Auntie, I've decided I, I want to uh, to be ordained, and I said, and, and I and I'd like, and I said, and, and this is how foolish I was. I said to him, yeah, and I I would uh, I would like to you know do it as quickly as possible. And what what do I need to do? <laughs> I don't know whether this young fool thought he was going to get a magic bullet to a case, of, but. Uh, <laughs> um, well, he, in his very, very, very sort of mindful way, he kind of said, hmm, well, um, you're living in a community and working in the right livelihood hmm? and uh, there's study and meditation. Yes. And so, OK, Bandy, I get the idea. Uh, just follow the exoteric path. <laughs> Don't worry about uh, getting there. And in contrast to the exoteric path, we've got what we might call an esoteric path. Uh, these are the underlying layers of what's happening whilst we're engaged in all this exoteric in, in, uh, practice of, of, of the Dharma. Um, the exoteric path is, is really the path of the inner life, the path of our own very personal inner life, the path that not everybody can necessarily see. Um, and the path of the inner life is really the, the layers of subtle underlying experiences that, uh, and effects of practice that, that arise in the transformation of our nature from, from practice. That's, that's what kind of makes up this path. And really, it's the fruits of the purification of the glaciers. Um, in a way, you could say if we, the more we clear away the glaciers, from uh, from our mind, from our nature, then the deeper and more apparent the esoteric path becomes. In a sense, it gradually becomes the exoteric path for me personally, for you personally. Um, <coughs> so the, there's quite a lot to unpack in the sense of what the inner path of the inner life might be, but uh, I think it basically it reminds us that there is a, a deeper kind of oceanic nature to our mind, to our personal mind, something much deeper than the, the mind we walk around in on in, in everyday life. And the esoteric path, um, yes, I know we can get uh, um, entranced by the idea of the esoteric. So the esoteric path is not a special, some special teaching that we've been given. It really is just the, the realm of what's happening on a deeper level in our practice. Um, our meditation sessions might be exoterically pleasant experiences. They might be deep experiences. And they might be very ordinary experiences. But esoterically, they're all just steps on the long path to awakening. The esoteric path, really, I would 
to give a let me to give it a framework is essentially the liberation of our intrinsic awareness, the intrinsic awareness of our mind from the whole mess of ignorance, greed, and delusion. Um, yeah, it's going on the process quietly in, in our practice. So um, let me unpack the heart's journey a little bit further. And we come to the heart's journey. So that the idea of the heart's journey, uh, I think is very appealing romantically, uh, imaginatively, and it invokes the myth of an odyssey, invokes something like the, the myth that I mentioned earlier. It's a romantic quest. I think it's very important that the spiritual life Whereas the journey of our life is something of a romantic quest. Confess that I'm a romantic by nature, and maybe I perceive it that way, and so therefore it is the way it is. But I, I, I do think it's fair, fair call to say that the heart's journey is, is, has got some element of a romantic view of existence about it. And it's the stuff of the heroic archetypes like um, Hercules. And I think in spiritual life, it's really important that we need uh, a non-utilitarian sense of what it is that we're doing. Um, it's horrible when we have a utilitarian sense of our meditation. Am I getting into the first yana yet? Am I getting this in my meditation? Is, is this or that happening? Uh, it's not really very good for the, for the inner life, for the esoteric path. Uh, we need a non-utilitarian appreciation of the heart's journey to fuel imagination with a capital I. Um, imagination with a capital I is what uh, William Blake uh, encouraged us to, to uh, open up to be aware of in his injunction that we need to move from what he called the Maya of sense experience to seeing eternity, we would call that awakening. Um, and I think imagination, the ability to look outside of the box of our, our ordinary experience with it, or the limits of our understanding of, of experience is, is vital really uh, to the heart's journey. And that's, that's why it is very much something, uh, a quest of a myth, an odyssey, so forth. Um, the journey itself. Well, the journey itself really is a metaphor for a transition, um, an adventure, we might say, uh, a shift from the, the unknown to the, uh, sorry, so a shift to the unknown from the familiar, uh, <coughs> the familiar mind that, uh, that, that we, we walk around in, that movement towards big eye imagination. Uh, it's a shift to the new and the different uh, in, in experience. Um, now, we, we might have heard the idea that, oh, yes, uh, a, 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 foot, the, the, a foot, the first step is, is, this, is, is the beginning of a journey of a thousand miles to suggest that, you know, we get on with practice and it's going to be a journey of a thousand miles. Uh, and that's fair enough. But... Um, on the esoteric path, the journey, this journey, uh, this transition has no time in which it happens. Uh, there's no distance that it travels. Um, maybe that's part of my romantic way of appreciating things. I'll coming back to that at the end of the talk, at that point, but just let's stick on that, realizing that however long and in in years we think the spiritual life uh, is it really it's also something happening outside of time outside of place outside of the, the life we're in at the moment and then we come to heart the heart in the heart's journey so what is the heart so exoterically the heart is our emotional life uh, it's our lived engagement with the experiences of the sense world. It's, I think of it as being um, the flood of being me 
amid, an, uh, amid knowing a world of, of life around me. Um, so that's exoterical. This is what's happening, you know, what we can talk about and describe. So semi-esoterically, um, I would say that uh, the heart is, we can appreciate the heart by looking just a little bit deeper. Um, we can see this aspect of, of heart represented by the potter, the second image on the wheel, of, on the rim of the wheel becoming. So that second image, the potter, is a little chap called Harry, and he's generating emotion. Uh, it's the flow of mind and its actions that is generating. It's at the heart of what's driving us around the rest of the wheel. Um, it's the energy of the glaciers. It's the energy of love and compassion. It's, so that's that's really what what uh, we mean by heart. It's it's that whole movement of our of our mind of our being towards. Uh, towards really towards the Dharma in, in, in terms of where we're looking to be going. Um, let's think about what, what, how heart or mind is, is uh, spoken about in, in Buddhism, how it's given a reference as it were. There are many labels for what we call heart, uh, inverted commas. Uh, one of the Sanskrit Pali words that, uh, for heart that you probably know is chitta. Uh, so chitta is one of the main words that we use uh, to, to label mind or consciousness. Uh, the, there are three principal ones, I'll give you them there. So chitta is mind that's in, when we call, when we refer to mind as chitta, we generally mean mind that's imbued with emotion. Then there's manas. So manas, uh, we when we use that expression, we generally mean mind that uh, in, is engaged with thought and reasoning. And then there's vijnana. And this is, vijnana is uh, the, 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 the Buddhist term, the Dharma term for what we call consciousness on the, way, on the rim of the wheel of becoming. It's that third link, the monkey in the tree. It also appears as a person steering a boat in the fourth link. So consciousness is just mind imbued with knowing things through the senses. So it's mind that's completely taken over with and occupied with, saturated with, as it were, the world of our senses. Uh, yeah, <coughs> so there's the three words we, we try to use for mind and chitta, the, is perhaps the one I would prefer in terms of uh, referring to the heart that's undertaking this heart's journey. Chitta comes from uh, a root verb chit, which means to perceive, uh, to understand and be conscious of things. So chitta and manas, uh, they describe mind as functioning in certain ways, emotionally or through thought and, and reason. But Vijnana is much more complicated, convoluted than that. Uh, Vijnana is our personalized awareness of a self, knowing myself as a self, uh, of a world, awareness of a world in which self's in a relationship. And all that goes, uh, all everything that goes on in the experiences of being an unawakened person in the midst of, of samsara. So Vijnana, no doubt, is going to is his mind that has is coming on the journey, but Vijnana, the idea of Vijnana for our consciousness gives us a, uh, an inkling of what it is that uh, consciousness needs to do along the journey. We need to unpack um, our immersion in the experiences of being uh, an unawakened person in the midst of samsara. Looking at mind a little further, the Buddha describes mind, the essential nature of mind, as being luminous. Uh, luminous, but defiled by incoming defilements of the senses. And this is Vijnana. 
a luminous mind, no, nonetheless, at the heart of our consciousness, but defiled by uh, the defilements of the senses. I hope that doesn't sound like too strong an expression. Uh, I don't. I personally don't mind the idea that we're defiled by um, <laughs> by the things that we engage our mind engages with. So our understanding of chitta embraces the perspective that the mind, this heart that's on a journey, is both luminous in its essential nature and it's imbued with emotion that's reactive and responsive to experiences. It's not just a little light shining in the dark, darkness of ignorance. It's actively imbued with its involvement in the senses. So chitta is the mind, it's the heart, that goes on a journey of freeing itself of the defilements of mind as such. Chitta is the mind, it's the heart, that transcends being caught up in ordinary conscious, consciousness of existence as a being. A consciousness of, of, our, of our own existence as a being is a very, very significant um, experience that we're caught up in. We don't give it up very readily, do we? Um, so chitta, this is the mind that will embark on transcending that experience, that simple experience of being me, being me, being me. Uh, <coughs> so when we speak of the heart that undertakes the heart's journey, uh, it's this mind, this emotionally imbued awareness that seeks to transcend being caught up in the ordinary consciousness of existing as a being. We all have, of course, ordinary consciousness, but we also all have chitta. We also are, have this root innate awareness that's luminous in its nature, but though we don't normally see it. Um, we may experience it in meditation, if, if you know, but it's there, it's part of, of the consciousness that we have. So the heart's journey is, is a journey of a spiritual aspirant. It's a discovery of the nature of our own mind, perhaps a journey of rediscovery of the nature of our own mind, um, perhaps a journey of rescue of uh, the, the innate nature of our mind. Um, again, that's a popular mythic theme, the, the rescue. Um, It's a journey of rescuing chitta, our innate luminous mind, from the distracted confusion of vijnana, our consciousness, our experience of things of being me and so forth, is vijnana. A, a clear awareness needs to be rescued from that, rescued from our ordinary mind. Uh, Consciousness that, that precipitates in the process and may depict it in the wheel of becoming. Overcoming, escaping this consciousness is therefore a journey on an esoteric path. It's a journey that's got to go underneath, as it were, penetrate below all the processes that are going on that are depicted in what makes us a being in the wheel of, of becoming. It's a journey to the hidden true nature of, of our mind. It's a journey of liberation of chitta from the nidanas. Around the rim of the wheel of becoming, there are 12 nidanas. There are 12 uh, descriptions of a conditionality that creates what follows and that ultimately creates the nature of our existence, of a being, the nature of our mind. Nidana means, the word nidana means to bind down. So these those links on the rim of the wheel of becoming literally bind down our consciousness to the whole cycle of experiences that are described in the wheel of becoming. Uh, bind us down to living in the realms pictured in the middle of the wheel of becoming. So it binds us down to experiences that are giving rise to craving, grasping, 
the very underlying ignorance that makes, that makes samsara. So I want to finish on a note of samsara. Samsara, um, we know the metaphor, samsara is prison, a, a sideshow, uh, a distraction of fascinating experiences. Fascinating experiences in the realms of the wheel of becoming. But as well as the, and we have to recognize that as well as our spiritual heart's journey to the wonders of liberation and realizing through nature of our own mind, we are on a mundane heart's journey to samsara. Sobering to, rec to remember that we are on a mundane heart's journey to samsara. A journey around the realms in the wheel of becoming. So on this mundane journey, let's picture ourselves traveling along on a desert road in an open top car. It's a balmy evening, the warm air wafting gently on your face as we drive along with the warm smell of Kalitas rising up through the air. We're going to a hotel called California where we are all just prisoners here of our own device. Except, and I hope you've got it by now, we can check out and leave. Perhaps on the esoteric path, we have already checked out. I'm going to leave you with a few words of Confucius and then a little music. The way out is through the door. Why is it that no one will use this method? 